<laughs> well, good morning, brothers and sisters, and to those of you joining us on live stream. Yes, this is a glorious day, my friends. My name is Tim Earl, and I do have that privilege of being a part of the senior youth group. We have a lot of fun in that class, and you can imagine some of the discussions we have, too, getting into the Word of God. But this morning, I actually have the distinct honor of being able to bring to you the Word of God, and I take this very, very solemnly. It's a scary thing sometimes to present the Word of God to people, but thank you for opening us in prayer. As you know, over these past few months, our pastor, Pastor Sherwood, has led us through a careful and thorough study of the book of Daniel, a book which, by the way, Jesus Christ quotes more than any other from the Old Testament except for the book of Deuteronomy. And as you also probably know by now from our study, that the book of Daniel is comprised of 12 chapters, which can easily be divided equally between the first six chapters and the second six chapters. Now, those first six chapters we call narrative history or historical events. You know these stories probably from Sunday school and especially the last few weeks. You know, remember Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They get taken into exile, into captivity with their nation to Babylon. Daniel rises to great authority in the kingdom because he has a special gift given to him by God. He can interpret dreams and visions. And you remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown into that fiery furnace, but they aren't burned up. And then maybe one of the greatest stories of, well, maybe next to David and Goliath in the Old Testament, Daniel and the lion's den. We find all of that in the first six chapters of Daniel. Now, these events, several of which we discussed in a previous sermon a few weeks ago, which I called The Footprints of God, revealed a number of what we called timeless truths about our God, about His dealings with you and I, and about His dealings in the world at large. Namely, number one, our Heavenly Father is sovereign over the entire cosmos. Number two, He actually does intervene in real time and in real space in our history even today. And when he does so, he works through us, his chosen children. And we learned that those ancient stories from thousands of years ago still have modern day significance for us today. So, just as we discussed these issues in sort of a summary fashion back then at the halfway points between chapter 6 and chapter 7, Pastor Sherwood, if asked if I would do something similar today, now that we have completed the entire book of Daniel. And just as we had three important timeless truths that we discussed before, so too we're going to talk about three timeless truths today from these last six chapters, six chapters of which deal with end time prophecies and with visions and dreams and something that we call apocalyptic imagery. That's just a a fancy term. What it means is it's a type of imagery, a type of writing, a type of literature, which for many of us today seems and sounds like bizarre or grotesque, grotesque, really weird, something like out of a fantasy novel or maybe a horror movie from some of these things, but a type of medium, a type of speaking that actually can convey highly symbolic meanings. You'll see here as we get going here. And once again, we will learn that these ancient prophecies still hold modern day significance for us. So, the first of these timeless truths, slide one, is this. God has promised that a righteous Messiah will one day appear to whom belongs everlasting dominion. And try to remember if you can, it might be difficult as we go through this, but this is from Daniel's viewpoint thousands of years ago looking forward. Some of this is going to be in our own future, but we'll get to that. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the second timeless truth that we're going to talk about this morning is that God has provided spiritual protection in the battles that lie ahead for all those of us who have committed our lives to Jesus Christ. And then the third and the final timeless truth is that God, hallelujah, has provided and prepared for us an everlasting kingdom, slide three here, and and for those of us who are his followers, we will partake of that, 
but everlasting condemnation for his enemies. And it is these timeless truths, especially this last one, which lead us to the title of our sermon today, slide four, The Everlasting Kingdom, Daniel 7 through 12. All right, enough of the groundwork. Let's get into this. Without further ado, let's jump into Daniel's prophecies, prophecies, as I said, that were made almost 26 hundred years ago. Two and a half millennia ago, these prophecies were uttered, and yet they still hold life-changing significance for us today. Here we go. In Daniel chapter 7, we witness one of the greatest prophecies and promises of all time. At first, Daniel sees four bizarre beasts rising up out of a tumultuous sea, beasts which are exceedingly strong and also very terrible to behold. And in this type of imagery, when he talks about a sea like that, it's actually an image of sort of the unbridled and chaotic mass of humanity on the globe of this earth. Now, these four beasts, we're told, represent four kingdoms and four kings, all of which will arise in the future. And again, we're talking about from Daniel's viewpoint in the past. But the last of these rulers from the fourth kingdom, when he arrives, he is in our future. He will turn this world upside down. He will blaspheme the God of heaven. He will seek to put to death the saints of the Most High God. And he will proclaim himself, in essence, God on earth. And for all intents and purposes, this individual who we call the Antichrist, will seek to destroy and eliminate the kingdom of God and all of God's saints. That's you and I. But then, in this vision, Daniel sees something else. He sees what we might call the heavenly courtroom, the heavenly throne room of God. God Almighty himself is there in the vision. He's called the Ancient of Days. And in this vision, God is opening up the books ready to pronounce judgment, maybe like a supreme court in heaven. And here is where that greatest prophecy, the greatest promise of them all comes into play. As God Almighty is about to render his judgment, Daniel records this for us in chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, slides 5 and 6. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, He came before the Ancient of Days, that's God Almighty, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and a glory and a kingdom, and that all the peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one which shall not be destroyed." Well, this is a glorious vision, but who or what is this Son of Man? What does this mean to us? Well, I hope you will allow me to allow Jesus of Nazareth to answer this question for us. We're going to go through through some verses here. First one, Matthew 16, verses 13 and 16, slide 7. Jesus says this. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I the Son of Man, am. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Jesus Christ is this promised Son of Man. Okay, well, does that explain what it is? I mean, what does that mean? What is the Son of Man going to accomplish? Again, let's let Jesus Christ answer this for us. I'm going to give you about half a dozen scriptures, all from the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus explains what this is. Matthew 9, verse 6, slide 8. So that you, so that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, Jesus said to the paralytic man, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. So the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, not only has the power to heal, but he also has the power to forgive sins. Matthew 13, 41, slide 9. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. So the Son of Man will judge the wicked, and He will cast them out of His kingdom. But that's not all. Matthew 16, 27, slide 10. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels, 
and then he will reward each according to his works. So the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, one day will reward his faithful servants. But before he comes in the glory of his Father, something else has to transpire first. Matthew 20, verse 18, slide 11. Behold, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. So the Son of Man, this one coming in the future, is going to die? That doesn't make sense. Why? Matthew 20, 28, slide 12. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In other words, the Son of Man sacrificed himself when he came for the first time on that cross for the forgiveness of sins for all those of us who have committed ourselves to him. This happened, as I said, at his first coming, but this is not where it ends. Continuing on, Matthew 24, verses 29 through 30. These are two slides, slides 13 and 14. says this, and this is in our future, mind you. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven. Here's that apocalyptic imagery I'm talking about. The powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then finally, the last one from Matthew 25. We have several verses here, slides 15 through 17. This is 25, 31 through 32, 34 and 31. He says this, when the Son of Man comes in His glory, this is really important, and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another. Verse 34. Then the King will say to those on His right, He's speaking to the righteous ones, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you, from the foundation of the world, verse 41. But then he will say to those on his left, these are the wicked, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. This is what the word of God says. This is what Jesus said. So the son of man, Jesus Christ, will return one day to establish an everlasting kingdom and to render judgment on all mankind. This God Almighty has promised. This God Almighty has ordained. This is according to Scripture. And Scripture tells us that God Almighty cannot lie. Therefore, this will come to pass at some point in our future, which invariably forces each and every one of us to have to ask ourselves one question. Am I prepared for this event? All right, that was the first timeless truth. Second, timeless truth from the last six chapters, prophetic chapters of Daniel, is that God Almighty has provided spiritual protection for the spiritual battles that we, His children, will invariably and inevitably face in life before the return of our King. Now, there's several times in the book of Daniel, in these last seven chapters, where Daniel is visited by angelic messengers who come to enlighten him as to his visions. Even though he's the greatest vision person who can interpret in history, he still needs them to interpret for him these true meanings. And most often, the most angel that most often shows up is Gabriel. You've heard of him before, right? If you never have, you will in the next couple of weeks when we talk about the Christmas story, because who did he come to? Mary, correct? The mother of Jesus of Nazareth, telling her that her son was the son of David, the Messiah, the son of man. 
Well, every time one of these angels shows up to Daniel, he does one of two things. He either becomes distressed and alarmed, as we see that in chapter 7, verse 15, or he becomes frightened and falls flat on his face in chapter 8, and, or he becomes exhausted and sick for days. And that's found in chapter 8 as well. He has no strength left in him. And these reactions are not only because of the fact that a supernatural being, I mean, think of it. If a supernatural being, an angel, comes standing in front of you, what are you going to do? But that's not the only reason why he has this reaction to him. It's even more so because of the biblical prophecies that this angel Gabriel is explaining to him about the future. Now, permit me, let's just take one second here. I want to interject something here in case any of you are thinking of this. Some of you may be thinking, well, you keep talking about these prophecies. I mean, what are you talking about? Somebody with a crystal ball seeing this stuff? I mean, that's just all hocus pocus stuff. That's like from people that, you know, are superstitious. It doesn't have anything to do for, with us today, does it? Well, let me share you one of like several verses from the New Testament which would say the contrary. This comes from 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 21, slide 18, and this is, I mean, amazing. It says, for prophecy, and it's talking about biblical prophecy here, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So yes, prophecy does have meaning for us. So now, in a nutshell here, let's kind of simplify this a little bit. The prophetic message relayed to Daniel is this, and this is, may enlighten some of you here, behind governments and the powers of this world that we see with our, our naked eye, there also lurks, according to the Word of God, an unseen realm of supernatural powers and entities that can manipulate them. Supernatural powers who, dare I even say it in church, are hell-bent on destroying the kingdom of God, destroying you, me, and our witness, our ministry, everything. And we see this evidenced, for example, in a couple of places, but especially in Daniel chapter 10, where an angel comes to Daniel, and when he gets there, he explains to Daniel why it's taken so long for him to come. It's, Daniel's been praying earnestly, fasting, and so forth for 21 days. Finally, the angel shows up, and he explains to him why it took, it so, took him so long. And he does this in Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, this is slide 19, where he says this. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now, the angel isn't speaking about some earthly king. I mean, what power does one earthly human king have to standing against an angel? He wouldn't be able to. And he calls in Michael for help. Michael comes. We learn from other scriptures that Michael is an archangel. So, in the hierarchy of angels, he's one of the most powerful ones. And so, he has to come and help this angel in time so that this angel can come and speak to Daniel. So, the prince that he's talking about, a Persian, must, by definition, be another supernatural being, another angel, something like that. Now, if, if this revelation about evil supernatural powers lurking behind the shadows, behind the powers of this world, if that isn't scary enough, then the vision, the far-reaching vision of Daniel chapter 11 is. That's what the angel came to describe to Daniel. Once again, just in a nutshell, we just kind of have to summarize this. Chapter 11, it's a very difficult, it's one of the most difficult chapters in the Bible, but it paints a detailed picture of the future, the future of God's people, mainly from Daniel's viewpoint, a future which, if you said, Tim, can you just sum it up in two words? Yeah, total war. That's what I'd sum it up in. It's the chapter, if you remember, where there's king after king after king, kings of the north, kings of the south. They're fighting continuously with each other. And who's right in the middle of it most of the time? The children of God, Israel, God's chosen people. This timeline of war filters down from Daniel all the way in time, 483 years down to the time of the first arrival, the first advent of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And you remember on Good Friday when he marches in on that donkey into Jerusalem, the people are hailing him as the Messiah, and he doesn't quiet them to that. But the vision also culminate, uh, culminates in a future, our own future, in a person which we know as, or who we know as, the Antichrist.
And lest you think that this timeline of war, and we're talking about physical war as well as spiritual war. Both of these are, in, are uh, involved here. Lest you think that these only apply to the Jews, because realistically speaking, from Daniel's viewpoint, he's speaking to Jews. There aren't any Christians yet in the world. But lest you think he's only speaking to Jews, in that regard, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament sets us straight. So let me add a verse here. This is 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 4. Some of you may know these. This is slide 20. It says this. There's two of them. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That means they're not forged on earth. They're not earthly weapons. But they are mighty in God for the pulling down of fortresses. And then in Ephesians 6, 11 through 13, slides 21 and 22, he clarifies this point, Paul does, when he instructs each and every one of us to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, to stand firm. Now, when Paul speaks about the whole armor of God, he's referring to everything that you and I have in our arsenal that we can muster for our service in the war for the kingdom of God on this planet. This means that we are to actively, actively, actively exercise our faith. I don't know how many times in my life I've said this. Faith is not just a noun. It's not just a person, place, or a thing. It is a verb. It is something to be lived. It means reading the word and studying it. Even chapter 11's like in Daniel, which you're going, who is this king? Who is this queen? What's going on? It's there in the Bible for a purpose. It means something. We need to understand it if we're going to understand understand God's will. It means praying diligently and consistently for the Lord to give us strength and to open His will to us so that we can fulfill it. I mean, it means all of these things and many more things that we just don't have time to go into. Now, at this point, let's take a breather here just for a second. I'm getting out of breath on all of this. If this is true, you might be thinking this, if this is true what we're saying, then how can I possibly do this in my own strength? Well, there is a blessed answer in this regard, and it is, you don't have to. You don't have to do this in your own strength. The Word of God explicitly, explicitly tells us that we are not alone in this struggle. Let me just give you a couple verses here, and then we'll move on. In 1 Corinthians 6.19, this is slide 23, it says this, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own. And then Ephesians 3, 16 adds, slide 24, that he, this is God, would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. And then Romans 8, 26, first part of the verse there, slide 25. Likewise, the spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. Notice plural, weaknesses. And then finally, Romans 8, 9a, slide 26. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells with you. So in other words, my friends, you have the Spirit of the immortal and eternal God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, residing within you to aid you in your time of need, no matter what the enemy decides to throw at you. And if we understand even one one one-hundredth of Daniel's prophecies about the future, we are going to need every bit of help that we can get from the Holy Spirit. Okay, third final timeless truth as we start heading to the end of the sermon is that God has prepared an everlasting kingdom for his righteous servants, that's us, but just the opposite for his enemies. Now, this is kind of detailed here and hard, so let's see if we can do this. The last four verses of chapter 9, we're not going to turn there, but they contain a very, very famous prophecy called the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel. 
The, this intricate prophecy details a 490-year period, the first 483 of which, so take the last seven, just hold those for a second, the first 483 of which culminate in the arrival, and we kind of mentioned this already, of the Messiah, who we know to be Jesus Christ, also the Son of Man. With his entry into Jerusalem, as we said on Good Friday, his death, his burial, and his resurrection from the dead for the forgiveness of sins. But after that time, there seems to be an interval after that 483rd year of an indeterminate amount of time uh, for the prophecy after the death of Messiah before a final figure will appear at the end of the age during that final seven years to make up the full 490. You already know who this person is that we're talking about, the Antichrist. A person who will make it his job, it will be a part of his job description, I guess, to bring catastrophe to God's people during a period of what the Bible calls a great tribulation. And he'll set himself up as, I guess, like the savior of the world. This same sort of timeline, this 490-year timeline we're talking about, we also think is in the last part of Daniel chapter 11, a chapter which you'll recall, these kings fighting all of the time with each other, and these kings have a direct impact on the nation of Israel, and all of these kings, except the very last one mentioned at the end of chapter 11, have already come and gone in history. But this last one has not yet appeared. And again, you know who we're talking about. When this last human ruler arrives sometime in our own future, one who will exalt himself, it tells us, above every God that there is, then the end is at hand. He will devise a plan. I, I don't know. For some reason, when I read this in the scripture, I think of Adolf Hitler. He had a plan to exterminate the Jews called the final solution for the Jews in, in uh, World War II. I, I, that just comes into my mind. But he will devise a plan, again, he'll make it his, with all of his energy, to take out God's people. And for all intents and purposes, God's people will be on the verge of extinction. Then, Daniel chapter 12, the last chapter of Daniel comes into play, and it's glorious. Daniel 12, verse 1, two slides, 27 and 28. At that time, Michael, remember, he's an archangel, shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. It is at this point that we learn from back in Daniel chapter 7. And don't worry so much about the chapters. These things kind of intermingle with each other. And along with some other scriptures, that the Son of Man... Who's the Son of Man? We know, Jesus, right? It is at this time that the Son of Man will return to earth on the clouds of heaven to vanquish this wicked, evil ruler, this man of lawlessness. He's got a whole bunch of uh, epitaphs in the Bible. And to establish his own kingdom. And we also learn something else that is glorious here in the very next verse, Daniel 12, verse 2, slide 29. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. My friends, this is one of those rare, rare instances in the Old Testament that mentions what the New Testament calls the resurrection of the dead with the righteous rising up to everlasting life with King Jesus and the wicked to contempt and everlasting shame. And this brings us, I guess, sort of full circle back to that all-important promise and all-important prophecy in Daniel chapter 7. Remember the one where the Son of Man's presented before God Almighty and the kingdom's given to Him? Because there's also a promise embedded there that I didn't read to you. We're saving the best for last. Here it is, Daniel chapter 7, verse 27, slide 30. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey Him. And I guess this leads us to the final verse in the book of Daniel, a verse that today even has relevance for you and for me, especially if the Lord tarries before His second coming. The final words, the final verse, Daniel chapter 12, verse 13, 
the angel speaking to him says this, but you go your way until the end for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of days. What he's saying there is, Daniel, you are going to die, but one day you will rise again to share in their everlasting kingdom of God. Same applies to us in this room. Again, if the Lord waits to return, we will die too, and one day that day will come. And then this, of course, leads us to one final question that I leave with each and every one of you. Will you, because of your faith in Jesus Christ, which includes not only believing in your mind that He is the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Messiah, who died for our sins on the cross and rose again from the dead, but which also, faith, also includes committing your entire existence to Him, will you be one of the righteous who rises again to everlasting life with the Son of Man? Or will you be one of the wicked who suffers everlasting shame and contempt and judgment because of your rejection of the true king? My friends, I truly, I truly, truly from my heart hope it is the former because if these three timeless truths are correct, then glory awaits those who follow Christ. May I have the worship team come back up? What are those three truths again? Let's put them up here on the, on the slides up here, slides 32 through 34. First, God has promised that a righteous ruler, a Messiah, will one day appear to whom belongs everlasting dominion. Number two, God has provided spiritual protection to aid us in our battles that surely lie ahead in the lives of those who have committed themselves to Jesus Christ. And three, God has prepared an everlasting kingdom for his righteous servants, but everlasting contempt for his enemies." These things will transpire, my friends, because they have been prophesied. And you may say, well, how do you know? How do you know? Let me leave you with one final scripture. This is amazing from the Old Testament. It comes from Isaiah 46, 9 through 11. I'm just going to put part of it up here for you. The last three slides, 35 through 37. See what is said here. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I also will do it. So just as these ancient narrative stories in the first six chapters, remember the stories, still have modern day significance for us? So too do these ancient prophecies have modern day significance to us. My friends, last thing here, if you haven't heard anything else, hear this. We neglect these prophecies at our own peril. Enough said. Be prepared, my friends. Go in peace and power. Let us pray.